Captain Keys. Nice to see you. And we're live on YouTube as well. So we're doing both TikTok and YouTube today. Um, and we'll be looking at the text Atma board, which is a Hindu non-dual text. And it's one of the foundational texts. Um, so um, my beard is a bit messy. I think it's because I wore my mask earlier. Um, so yeah, but <laughs> little I can do about that. Right, so let's get my Kindle app up so we can discuss Atma board. This is going to be a good one. So hope everyone's doing good and um, nice to see you, everyone. Right, so I'm not gonna read from my um, I find it's easier to read from the screen because it's a bit bigger. Okay, here we go. Oh okay. So I hope everyone's doing good. Are you having a good day? And hope you're ready for a bit of learning. So last time we looked at um, verse six and seven, um, I think we went through that about how um, we talked about Brahman and Maya and we looked at how Brahman is the material cause and basis of the entire world and everything rises and exists and dissolves like bubbles in this world. Hey, Smiles is TikTok. Nice to see you. I'm doing good, doing good and good to see you. So, um, so the next verse we're going to look at is verse 9 of Atma Board, and that is, All living and non-living beings appear to take various forms, interwoven in the truth, conscious, eternal, and all-pervading super-self, just as the same gold takes various forms in different ornaments. I think we looked at that as well, but again, just re-emphasizing that everything is made from that same one substance that we call Brahman, and that is the nirgun. So no matter what, you know, if you have a, a bracelet, ring, necklace, chain, whatever is made from gold, when you melt it into a pot, it becomes one. The same thing, like although we see the many, actually it's just one. It's just this one Brahman, this one universal uh, formless awareness that is the the substratum of everything. So that's the way to understand it. Then the 10th verse is, just as the all-pervading space appears to be different due to various limiting objects, in the same way the soul appears to be different due to differences perceived by the sense organs. When limitations on space are removed, destroyed, only space remains. Similarly, when the soul is observed without limitation of sense organs, it only remains in its purity. This is pretty deep, actually, and not everyone's going to uh, grasp uh, what this may mean. So we'll have to break it up a little. So just as the all-pervading space appears to be different due to various limiting objects, in the same way, the soul appears to be different due to differences perceived by the sense organs. So again you know, you have space everywhere, but we see different things occupying this space. So you'll have houses, trees, plants, cars, uh, 
stones, rocks, everything is invading space on this earth. And then even when you go further than that, the universe, there's things occupying that space too. Uh, nice to see you, Martin. Uh, thank you. Thank you for appreciating the wisdom. So you have all these things and these limiting objects um, occupy this all-pervading space. But space is not different. Space does not go less because of the things that are occupying it. It still remains as it is. And the same thing with the soul or the Atma or the Jeev. It appears to be different because we perceive things from the body, so from the sense organs, so from our eyes, from our ears, from our nose, from, you know, all these sense organs define how we perceive the world. And the same way, when that happens is, we believe the senses and therefore we associate that with the body and mind and then and then the identification begins. So that is also a reason why we this, the Atma will feel different to Brahman or to the ultimate reality. So then it says, when limitations on space are removed or destroyed, only space remains. So again, if you took everything away, all the universe, all the planets, all the trees, if you took everything away, everything was dissolved away or imploded, and there's only space, it does not change. Space will remain as it is. Yeah? And the same thing, when the soul is observed without limitation of sense organs, so when we perceive the soul without our sense organs, then it remains as it is. We see it for what it really is, which is all pervading. It's the same as Brahman. Now, the only thing is we have to ensure that we do not perceive this Brahman through our sense organs. That's the ultimate stage that we need to get to. That's the ultimate point that we need to get to. So, you know, for example, uh, to put this into a more digestible way, uh, just as various mirrors from form different images of the sun and make it appear as many, so does the supreme reality gets reflected from various intellects and appears to be many. So this is a very well, uh, really interesting way to see it because if you've, there's a scene in Inception where the where they're moving the mirror and it's they're coming off the bridge and. Um, Elliot Page now, she um, he he moves the uh, door. It's like a door, and there's a mirror, and you can see like an infinite amount of uh, space, uh, infinite amount of reflections. Same thing here. There's infinite amount of reflections of this one Brahman. We limit it according to our senses, and we say this is what it is. But actually, Brahman is a lot more. Is a lot. Is just one. There's no different, reflect the reflections are not separate to the one. And this is what we need to understand. So these reflected images of the supreme reality are called different living and non-living entities. When we see the sun directly, we know that variances are not real. So when you see the sun in the image, in the mirror, you're going to see the sun, not the mirror. Yeah, the, the sun in the mirror is not the real one. If you touch the sun that's on the mirror your hand's not going to feel warm or it's not going to get closer to heat or it's not going to burn. Yeah, but so this is what I mean. The reflection is not fully uh, the, is not th that real thing. So likewise, um, even though we are, there's different, we see, we see the world in its multiple, um, many forms, it's still one. It's still Brahman. Now, space is... So, similarly, when we see the Supreme Reality, these reflective forms lose their significance. So, you know, we then understand that the things that we see as separate, actually, is just that one Brahman. And therefore, it loses all its power, all its might. Now, space is subtler than the clay, so clay containers cannot partition it, though it appears... To be so, when the container is broken, there remains no difference in the internal and external space. Similarly, when the boundaries of our intellect are surpassed, the supreme reality is seen in its indivis indivisible abundance. And this is ultimately what it's about.
if you if we really want to go beyond we have to go beyond duality if we see the world in duality we're going to see multiple forms therefore we're going to think that brahman is also separate now if we use the analogy that's used about the clay pot you can have multiple clay or you reuse the example of the gold same thing you may have different containers of clay but it's made up of that one substance which is clay itself the pots may be different but the substance the thing that it's made of is the same so likewise with brahman we all may appear as different but we're all one we're all that same brahman uh, so I have a few questions. I'll answer some of them. Uh, some on TikTok have got some comments, so I'll, I'll answer them. Uh, someone said, God is a social construct meant to control populations before modern laws were in place. I don't care. Um, it's not really going to make a difference uh, to me. Uh, and then what are you going to do when you find out there's no point to all of this? I'm not nihilistic, so... Wrong crowd, my friend. Um, <clears throat> so, this next one could be an interesting conversation. Different auxiliary entitlements such as caste name the order of life according to age. So that's like the Verna Ashram, basically. Um, are superimposed on self, just as the flavor, color are superimposed on water. This is very interesting. See, um, sorry. See, the thing is, why that's interesting is because yesterday I was talking about um, cast on Aladdin's um, page on the on, on his YouTube live, and it came up. You know, people think they can be smart when they talk about caste and they can talk about uh, a Hindu um, and they'll quote some scripture to say, this is what, you know, we uh, caste is everything. Caste should be followed and caste uh, people are seen as less. And, you know, they, you know, the people that want to get rid of the division sometimes are the ones that perpetuate the, the division more. And they're not doing the same work that I'm doing, which is trying to get rid of the division and the separation that people put in. So a lot of people you will find, even though they may be saying, why is this said in the Vedas? Or why is this said in the Upanishad? They're not looking to challenge it so they can improve things. They challenge it to perpetuate the problem, to make it much bigger issue than it actually is. So... And here, Adi Shankaraji is very clear. These different things that you call your caste, your name, your order of life that you're in, according to your age, they're superimposed on the self. They're not actually the self. They're not Brahman. They're not your real self. They're not who you really are. They are just add-ons to you. Do you need to believe in those add-ons? No. Look, when you have a phone, you can choose to delete an app if you want. You don't have to keep the app. The same way with a name, it's just a name. You can you can you can change your name. Legally, you can change your name, so your name means nothing. And then even with caste, that is something society has put onto you. You don't have to follow that. Your age doesn't mean that you're not wise. This atma has no age. This atma is eternal. So this is something we can understand. And the example that uh, Adi Shankarji uses here is that you know you can change the flavor and color of water and that's because it's superimposed so for example when you put uh, rose syrup you know in india we in the south asian households we drink ruavsa and it's a red rose syrup you put that into the drink and the into the water and the water becomes not only taste of that sweet rosiness it also is um it also changes to the color red. So, but water has remained the same. The water hasn't changed. Water remains as it is. It's just that now there's an added flavor to it. And now there's an added color to it. That's the only thing that we need to understand. Uh, so, yeah, 
So uh, various characteristics we carry about with, uh, you know, that this is who I am, do not actually belong to us. They belong to the gross, subtle and causal bodies, which we're going to look at today as well. The self is devoid of them, just as the water is devoid of various colors, flavors, which are added to it. It's very simple, uh, easy thing to understand. And now we're going to look at the physical, subtle and causal bodies. But before we do that, we have a question. So let's have a look at this question. From Jay Marthadi, my good friend, Dimitri. Um does the Agna Chakra play a role in seeing Brahman, whether looking inward or outward? In general, what is its role? Uh, I'm not too familiar with chakras, if I'm honest with you. Um, I, you know, it's so weird. I have read about chakras so many times, but for some reason, I can never retain it. I can never remember. Um, the only one I remember is the crown chakra, the... That's the only one, and the third eye. So is the Agna one the third eye? I only really remember that. I, I mean, I know where they're physically located, the chakras are, you know, but um, what role they play, I'm not too sure. Um, what I would say is probably read Osho when he talks about that. Um, but say even talking about the third eye, um, and okay third eye can talk a little bit about so it plays a little bit of a role but i wouldn't say it's a it's only a sign like a signpost it's not necessarily you know you have to um experience like you have to experience it to show that you're going further on in your journey um so when you're concentrating on Brahman, the formless awareness, your third eye will probably look more likely inward than outward because it's where it's its way of focusing on that uh, no location, no image, no form uh, consciousness, the contentless consciousness. So that's what it's going to do. But it's just a sign that you're on the right path, really. Nothing more. Um, it may have other effects, but there are probably better people that can talk about that, if I'm honest. Um, I'm just going to be really honest about it. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert on the chakras. Uh, there's a lot of uh, experts on TikTok. You can, uh, you can, um, you can definitely uh, they they can be they can definitely entertain you on, on that. Uh, for sure. Um, so, um, let's let's carry on with the Atma board. But wonderful question, though. Um, so, if you remember Tatva board, this is kind of like um, you could say a revision, just to remind you. Um, so, the physical body is born out of the fivefold combination of five great elements according to the previous actions so our previous karma um, it is a medium in which pleasure and pain are experienced just before i go into that verse um yeah so the thing with chakras it's not going to help you immensely you know for example some people have a kundalini awakening you don't have to a lot of people just have this silent awakening that occur occurs without the chakras and without the um, without the kundalini awakening. So, um, yeah, it's really up to um, it's really dependent on the person and whether they get affected by it. Really. Um, so yeah. So looking at verse twelve there. So basically, as we know, our uh, Physical bodies composed of the five great elements, which is earth, water, air, fire, and space, um, in their fivefold combined form. So, to explain that again, the fivefold combined form of space consists of one half of pure space mixed with one eighth part of earth, water, air, and fire, each in their pure form. So, that's how it's really seen as, um, and that's the physical body. 
So because of these elements, we are subject to pleasure and pain. And that is something the body and the mind will be, so the body will be uh, aware of and will go through. Now, the subtle body is made up of five vital airs, which is the pranas, uh, which is combined with ten organs of sense and action, uh, and the mind and intelligence. Made up of elements in their fundamental form, this subtle body is the instrument of experience. So, again, our subtle body is composed of 17 constituents, which themselves are made up of five pure basic elements, which is earth, water, fire, air and space the five sense organs are eyes ears nose tongue and skin five action organs are hands legs voice reproduction and excretory organs the mind can think and the intelligence can decide the subtle body makes it possible for us to experience pleasure and pain in the physical body so the physical body is the one where we experience pleasure and pain it's the subtle body that causes us to actually experience it so in terms of it is a power behind um, the experience of pleasure and pain. Then the 14th body, which is about 14th verse, which is a 14th body, 14th verse, which is about um, the causal body. And that is ignorance, which is without a beginning and indescribable, is known as the causal body. Whatever is other than these three auxiliary bodies grows subtle and causal, know that to be self so again with atma board adi shankaraji is doing the same technique of telling us that you know there is something beyond this gross subtle and causal body and that is the self so uh, where are we yep so ignorance is termed as indescribable because if it is real it cannot be destroyed by knowledge, and if it is unreal, it cannot create this world. So it is neither real nor unreal. Hence, we call it indescribable. That's quite interesting about ignorance, right? We often think that ignorance is a bad thing, but here it's saying it's neither real nor unreal. And um, and the reason for that is because it cannot be destroyed by knowledge uh, if it was real, and if it's unreal, it cannot create this world. So, you know, there needs to be ignorance for the world to be created. Uh, so the question is, well, how is the self? How is this Atma? How is this, um, you know, awareness separate, uh, different to the various types of bodies? The soul, um, the Atma, though pure, due to its association with the five sheaths, appears to be like them just as a, an apparent, sorry, just as a transparent crystal appears blue due to blue colored cloth in its vicinity. We've all seen that where there is um, something, you know, there's a transparent crystal and you put like a red film over it or a red um, plastic film over it, plastic um, sheet over it, and it just dons that color. You think the, that crystal is red or blue or green. Um, and the same thing with the Atma, when it's associated with the five sheets, um, which is the Anmai Gosha, Pranamai Gosha, Manamai Gosha, Vigyanamai Gosha, and Nandamai Gosha, and we'll go into what they are in a minute, uh, that is, um, I think that is what, um, that is what makes us feel that we are this body, um, and we get deluded into thinking we're the body because we associate with the five sheets. And we're going to go into what the five sheets are in the next verse. I think you can have zero information about chakras and still awaken. More often than not, it's just a distraction to think you need to move or clean some energy in chakras in order to awaken. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, they have certain, you know, they're good indicators, that sort of I wouldn't take it any further than that. Um, but yeah. So, just as rice is separated from its covering husk, so does the pure and internal Atma 
is separated from these five outer sheets by proper reasoning. Um, so to go into that, um, let's go into that now. So what is the proper reasoning which makes it possible to separate the self from the outer sheets? Proper reasoning is gained by listening to the sayings of the scriptures, pondering over them and regular practice to understand it. As the husk of the rice is different from it, the five sheets of the self are different from it. Let us build the argument for each of the sheets. So let's look at them and then let's, uh, let's look at how the self is eternal and the self is not like that. So the Anamai Kosha, which is the body, the sheet that's created by food, um, is not the same as the self because it is lifeless and does not exist before birth or after death. We know that this body has a very limited lifespan and is always subject to change. So therefore, it cannot be the Atma because the Atma is eternal. Uh, then you have Pranamai Kosha, which is the sheet of vital airs. It's not the same as the self because it is afflicted with hunger and thirst and is bounded by the body and is lifeless and has the nature of air. Self is considered to be free from hunger, thirst and is not like air. We know this to be true because the Atma is not hungry, the Atma does not have desires, the Atma does not um, feel thirsty, it doesn't have any of those feelings. So we know it's not like air. Uh, then there's Manumai Kosha, which is the sheath composed of mind. And that's not the same as self because it is attached to the body. It's the one thing that considers it, it considers the body as me and mine. And then when it looks at another person, it says you and yours. Moreover, it is connected with a feeling of passion and malice. So passion for the what, things that you like or desire and malice for the things that you dislike and do not want to be around. Um, so the self is considered to be free from attachment and aversion. Thank you, Vera, for that. Very nice, kind of you. So that is the understanding of the three uh, sheets so far. So now we're going to go into Vigyana Maikosha, which is the sheet of the intellect. And that's not the same as the self because it disappears in the state of deep sleep. So self is considered to be always present so and that's true because we do not use our discernment in deep sleep we there's the absence of the discernment so we know that to be true then ananda maya gosha which is a sheath composed of ego so that is not the same as self because in deep sleep with a finite pleasure it accepts itself as if in bliss so it has this vision this un, this belief that it is in bliss in deep sleep but it's not bliss because remember bliss is uncreated um but the self is considered to be bliss abound therefore separating the self from each of these sheets one can experience it in isolation so if you think about it this atma is such a tananda yeah it's it's, gone, it's real because it's changeless and formless. It's awareness itself, consciousness itself, existence itself, and it is bliss itself. It's not separate to bliss. That means that bliss is also eternal if the self is bliss. So deep sleep gives us the idea about bliss. It makes us feel blissful, but really it's not. So the 17th verse is this that though this self is always all-pervading, it is not seen everywhere. It is seen only in the intellect, just as a reflection in the, clean, in the clean mirror. So, for example, if the mirror of the intellect is contaminated by the dirt of passion and aversion, so rag and dvesh, you know, things that we like or dislike, it cannot reflect the self. And that's true. For example, if you if there is a mirror that is dirty and you look into the mirror and you see 
that uh, it looks it appears that your face is dirty and you keep cleaning your face but the dirt is still there because you haven't cleaned the mirror where the source of the dirt is so that's what we need to understand here that um when we only when we understand that actually it's not the face that is dirty it's the mirror so we need to clean the mirror likewise it takes us to get to that level of clarity where we can understand the self and see the self and be the self that happens when there's a long-term practice of listening and pondering of scriptural instructions the self is seen automatically now what's the instructions that are talked about what is real what is this sat what is this brahman that's what is considered to be scriptural instructions do not think of it to be the more cultural elements that are talked about as i mentioned here uh, although we do talk about advaita and we respect the vedas and we, we respect the scriptures but if something does not make common sense today we have to we have to put it aside we have to say it's not applicable for today so that's something that we need to understand so when we do a lot of listening pondering uh, contemplation the self is then seen automatically the self is seen for what it is so thank you for the rose very kind of you um so now verse 18 the soul is distinct or the atma is distinct from the body mind senses intellect and causal body know the self to be the witness of their activities just as a, as a king observes his subject we know this because the atma is the witness consciousness it's that witnessing the watcher the observer that is always there throughout all those states the atma does not change the atma is always there watching the atma is not going to change according to the body it's not going to change according to the senses to the mind to the intellect or the cause of body meaning in deep sleep it remains above all of these things and that's why we can understand that this awareness is always in awareness it's all about being aware of being aware and that's what it's all about so let's see um do i want to do the rest i think we'll just take questions for now i think let's just generally chat um and see what's going on um on youtube and tiktok so yeah let me know your thoughts um on what we've read today um or if you have any questions you want to ask I'm more than happy to address them so yeah any questions anything you want to ask um maybe there's something that you've watched earlier about um the pseudo non duality or if there's something you want to uh discuss in terms of deepening our connection with awareness things like that we can answer if you have questions about hinduism or how we should read the text i can also answer those things if my chat's working because 
It said it wasn't earlier. Uh, so things are looking good okay it's a quiet day today I understand duality correct I, I don't think we can understand duality in my opinion, because to understand duality, you have to understand a lot of things to understand the nature of duality. That's why duality can only be an appearance, not an understanding. Non-duality is the understanding, because that is always there. Duality is superimposed onto the non-dual self. So, in the next one that we'll do, um, we'll look at superimposition. So, that's going to be interesting. I think Atma Bodhi is quite an interesting um, text because it's kind of, um, it, it, there's a lot of imagery uh, mentioned in this um, so far. Uh, and it's my first, I think I've read this many years ago, I can't really remember, but superimposition they're good ways to meditate upon and think about and try and really you know contemplate upon and see how we can understand brahman or the self um so we'll look at superimposition and we'll look at ego oh these are really good stuff then there's neti neti I mean, we can even look at superimposition today if you want. I mean, I'm more than happy to. I just didn't want it to be too heavy. Um, uh, I don't have any questions. It's all pretty mind-blowing. I don't think intellectual mind has any say here, but that's so much for all the pointers. Oh, thanks so much for the pointers. Thank you. Thank you to Atma Board for giving us uh, these uh, pointers, really. Uh, thank you to Adi Shankaraji for giving us the um, ability to contemplate upon such matters. If I understand awareness correctly, everything must emanate from awareness in order for there to be no duality. Well, what we, what we need to understand is there is only awareness and everything is simply just a reflection of that awareness. So everything that we see, it's not that it's not... Uh, that is completely unreal it's um real only when there is a believer in the reflection uh, or there is the function of the reflection so the function of the body and the mind but um yeah everything does emanate from um awareness without awareness there is no observer of everything so that's why Awareness is seen as the first and most important principle. Direct experience is the only thing I can trust, if anything. And I agree. I agree. Um, direct experience is the only thing you can go by. 
we can all experience directly and have the direct experience of our awareness. We can all uh, feel what our awareness is. The observer is always there, if you think about it. Um, and when we turn inwards and we look at the observer, we see that actually there is just that awareness present. So I do agree that only the um, only direct experience is something you should trust, and I think that's a good shout. Um, I think that's a good thing. Okay, let's um. Let's do supreme position. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's have a look. Okay. So verse 19 is the self appears to be working in the activities of the sense organs to an indiscriminate person, just as the moon appears to be running when the clouds move in the sky. That's pretty interesting. So, for example, when you are... This is the whole thing of action in inaction and inaction in action. Uh, we, good luck, Charlie. We are reading Atma Board by Adi Shankaraji. So let me explain this because this is important. Like right now, the appearance is that you are listening or watching this and I'm reading. Yeah, it appears that there is an activity going on. When I'm sipping on my smoothie... Uh, it appears that my senses are doing something, yeah? I, one, I'm holding it, so my sense is doing one thing. When I drink it, my um, my tongue is tasting it, my mouth is tasting it. Um, when I, I can smell it, you know, so forth. It goes through the whole process, right? So we can understand that the self is not doing any work actually the self is not doing anything this is the function of the sense organs but to someone who cannot understand the truth will think that it's the self that is doing the action hi vikram singh rana um so likewise have you ever gone when you're in the car and you're driving and you see the moon, it seems that the moon is uh, moving along with you, but actually the moon is stationary. Or when the clouds move in the sky, it's not the, the moon that is moving, it's the clouds are moving. So we may f feel that the, sky, the moon is moving, but actually it's the clouds. So it's the same thing. The witness consciousness, the awareness, is always aware of the activities of the body and mind. But that doesn't mean that, that the awareness is changed in any way due to the activities being done. So that's something we can understand from Atma Bodh here in this very verse. So, what... Adi Shankaraji wants to highlight here is that with the example of the moon uh, moving when it's the clouds, is just to tell us that, you know, sometimes the uh, mind can, or our observations can deceive us. They can mislead us. So, when we observe anything, when we are making an observation, we are to think about it. We are meant to verify it. You know, is it the moon moving or is it the clouds moving? We need to think about it logically, rationally. 
and this is the most important part of um, Vedanta is that we we must use our intellect. We must verify the information. We must seek a teacher or the scriptures to help us. So I think we can understand this. This is very, very simple. But all I can say is that it's it requires a calm, serene mind to understand that it is the self that is witnessing and it's not the self or the Atma that is performing actions. The Atma does not perform any actions. It's the body and mind. Um, it, effortless effort. It's real. Just watch your body doing everything. It will do everything regardless. The identification is a secondary process and therefore it's superimposed and thus not real in my honest opinion. Well... It depends what you, uh, I think, okay, um, I think you're on about the identification towards action is superimposed, but yeah, okay, um, I don't think you're saying anything different actually to what Adi Shankaraji is saying, if I'm, if I'm got, got you right on that, Martin. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to confirm. <laughs> yeah, so you're literally saying the same thing. Um, so, you know, our sense organs, mind and intellect, which are the actual doers of our actions, and the self is just the witness. So we, um, the self is just the witness. The atma is just the witness. The awareness is just the witness. Um, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, verse 20, the body, senses, mind and intellect depend on the conscious energy of the self for performing their respective activities, just as the people depend on the sunlight for their work during the day. Yep, you know, again, fairly easy example, something we can understand very easily here, that it's the... Um, we need the light to do work in the day and the body, senses, mind and intellect all depend on this Atma to um, perform their actions. So the Atma is a real power behind everything. Consciousness is a real power behind everything. And that's something we can understand. Um, so yeah, that's very, very simple. Um, the Atma, as we know, does not take part in any of the activities. It just simply stays as itself that's all um then 21 out of ignorance the attributes and actions of the body and the senses appear to be superimposed on self which is of the form of truth and consciousness just as the blue and other colors are assumed to be colors of the colorless sky if you think about it there is not really a blue sky it's the it, it's it's actually clear. Uh, and likewise, um, the self does not have any attributes or actions of the body. Um, even though we may say, you know, we cannot say that the Atma is the one that's performing actions. We cannot say it's the Atma that is um, perceiving things through the senses or the senses. So those things are superimposed on the self. Um and it's ignorance to think so. It's ignorance that creates it. Um, and then, so whatever we see from our eyes might not be real. How? For example, consider the blue color of the sky. The sky is colorless, yet due to the scattering of light rays, it appears blue to us, which is quite true. So the blue color of the sky does not exist, but we see it from our eyes all the time due to its superimposition on a colorless background, which is quite interesting, right? Quite amazing. 
Similarly, our Atma appears to be the doer due to the imposition of the attributes of the sense organs, mind and intellect on it due to our false knowledge. If we somehow remove this false knowledge, we can know the reality directly. So we will understand that the sense organs, the mind and intellect is not doing, they, they are they are the doers, not the Atma, not the self. The real you is not the doer. So this is something we understand. And then the, I think this is the, no, we've got a few more. Uh, so due to the veil of ignorance, the activities, etc., of the mind are imagined in the self just as a moon appears to be moving by the movement of its image in the water. Um, so, for example, when the water is flowing, we think that the moon is also moving, but actually the moon is not moving, it's stationary. Uh, same thing with the Atma, even though it's reflected in the intellect and its image is formed, and that image is, is called the Jeev Atma, which is our assumed self. That is what identifies with the body. That is not real. That identification is not real. Um, so due to the movement of thoughts in the intellect, when this image moves, it appears as if it is the motionless soul or the motionless Atma is moving. The confusion about the movement of the moon goes away when we see the actual moon and not its image in the water. Similarly, the confusion of doership of the soul gets cleared when we know the self distinctly from its image in the intellect. So we know this Atma does not do anything. It is the body that's doing something. It's the intellect that is thinking something. It's the mind that is thinking something. But it's not the Atma. The Atma is always away from those things likewise we should not get fooled by the moving moon in the water we should actually look at the physical moon up in the sky and see that that has not changed so that is another way to see that so 23 now let's go to verse 23 Attachment, desire, pleasure, pain appear to be real in our intelligence. They are not experienced in deep sleep when the intellect dissolves in ignorance. So they belong to intellect and not to self. Very interesting. It's really interesting when you actually see that you're not the doer, the body continues doing everything, so does the mind. I agree. It is really amazing when you can step back as the observer and watch everything it's amazing how you can just be you feel so fulfilled in those moments so wonderful um so yeah so as we know in deep sleep intellect is dissolved in ignorance and we do not experience pleasure pain desire in that condition in deep sleep you're not thinking about whether you have a body ache that disappears even if you're say you broke your leg when you're in deep sleep, you're not aware of the broken leg. Yeah, it's only when you come out of that state of deep sleep do you know that your leg is broken and in pain. So uh, these feelings are the characteristics of the intellect, not of the Atma. The Atma is not the one going through pain. The Atma is not in Dukkh. The Atma is not in suffering. So if we overcome these tendencies of the intellect... When we are awake, we can witness the self. So the more we associate with the Atma, the better. The more we understand we're the witness, the better. The more we identify as that formless awareness, the better. That's the whole key. And then the last verse, and then we'll end the session, If and then we'll answer any questions if there are any questions. Just as the light is the basic nature of the sun, coldness is of the water, and heat is of the fire. So does existence, consciousness, bliss, eternity and purity are the nature of self. So the intrinsic nature of the Atma is to exist beyond the three states, past, present and future of time. 
It is also aware of its subjects without any external help, and it is the experience of eternal bliss without any trace of suffering or misery. It is devoid of any defects whatsoever. It is ever existing and pure or beyond the realm of the three gunas, which is sattva, raja, and tama of nature. So we know for a fact that this atma is really, the nature of the atma is satchit ananda, anantam, and sattva, purity, and eternal. Yeah, it is absolutely eternal. Um, it's existence itself, it's consciousness itself, it's just truth itself, it's bliss itself. And that's how we understand that that is the Atma. So, in this verse, in the last one, Adi Shankaraji explained that light is the basic nature of the sun. When we see the sun, it gives two things actually, light and heat. Same thing with the self. Its nature is bliss, its nature is consciousness, its nature is um, truth, existence, purity, and eternal. So that's what we can understand from that. So we'll end it here uh, in terms of Atma board. We are on uh, the chapter called Ego, and we only have... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven more chapters. So um, what we'll do tomorrow or I'll try and come on tomorrow. Um, if not tomorrow, it'd be next week sometime, um, probably Tuesday. Um, but we'll look at ego, neti neti and meditative practice. And if possible, we may even look at self-realization. So, so we'll definitely look at ego and neti neti, and then if if we can, we'll do meditative practice. So these are now we're getting into. We looked at tattva board, which was telling us what the tattva is. Now we're getting into how we can get to understand that we are the atma. So we go away from the identification of the body and mind, and we go towards the identification that we are this atma. We are this pure self, this pure awareness. So that is why when you have all this in mind, it helps you understand the nature of existence, the nature of the world and the nature of the Atma. Both are real in itself, yeah? But we know that one is only real for a limited amount of time. Therefore, on the grand scheme of things, it's unreal, which is the world. But this Atma, this Brahman is changeless. Therefore, that is our real self. That is a witness behind all experience that the world goes through. So that's what we need to go to, this Atma and this Brahman. That is the ultimate key. So, yeah, last um, last shout for questions. We'll, we'll end it in a couple of minutes. So the identification with the body and mind appears to be just a habit. It is a habit. Think about it every time. Think about it. If you get hurt, so, well, we have to understand first, if somebody punches me here and if I feel pain or say I feel pain in my chest, I will have to go to the hospital. The identification is to the function rather than saying I am the body. Yeah. We know that what, what would happen is we will identify the pain in the body and say, well, this body needs to go to the hospital <laughs> or to it needs to go 911 so the identification changes but is the atma going through pain no is the atma suffering no is the atma going to get affected by what occurs no yeah the atma remains pure complete in itself and that's what we have to understand um so we'll end it there um but it's really nice chatting to everyone. I really enjoyed your views. Um, and it's always nice to share the, this foundational wisdom because it is this foundational wisdom that takes us further in understanding non-duality and where we can understand and empathize with others, which is the most important thing after we've understood or if we've had an awakening 
the first thing that needs to occur is that we can empathize and have compassion for other people. So um, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, let me know in the comments after I've finished this stream. Um, you know, and I just want to say thank you for the support. Uh, I know some of you have signed up to my Patreon. I just want to say a massive thank you. You do not know how much that actually helps a podcast. So, you know, I really do appreciate the support and I really thank you. If you would like to subscribe to my Patreon, um, the link is in the video description below. Or if you're on TikTok, it's in my um, bio. So do sign up. It helps with the running cost of the podcast. Um, and you're supporting a content creator. So, um, so yeah, but thank you very much for those that are supporting. Even if you're watching and you, you know, some people, you know, you can't afford to uh, give anything. And But still, if you're viewing it, that's just as valuable as well. Um, you know, one has to see things in the sameness. Um, so, yeah, but anyway, take care, everyone. Stay safe and we'll see you again soon. Yeah, bye.